Another online edition. Uh, the local media for some time now we struggle with survival issues and exactly. So that's the problem. Uh, sometimes. Sorry for the inconvenience. Good morning and welcome to our roundtable with the Philippine Press Institute. Today we will talk about. COVID-19, vaccine acquisition, and the economy. We'd like to find out how we are doing as a country and as a people. Uh, no less than uh, Finance Secretary Sunny Dominguez III said uh, $1.2 billion in uh, financing for the procurement of safe and effective COVID-19 vaccines for the Filipino people have already been released by our partners, Asian Development Bank, World Bank, and Asian Infrastructure Investment Bank. So we'd like to find out how did we come up with the vaccines that we have today and how transparent is this and what impact did COVID-19 have on our economy? I'm sorry for the inconvenience a while ago because of some uh, technical difficulties, but let me begin by introducing our good friend Ariel Sibillino, Executive Director of the Philippine Press Institute, to open our discussions this morning. Ariel, good morning and welcome. Please unmute. Yes, go ahead. Good morning, everyone. Kuya Mera, thanks very much for having our guest today. Uh, you, you invite them. I think we have a panel of uh, experts today. Um, it's about time we talk about procurement and uh, the economy itself. How, so many questions surrounding the vaccination in the Philippines. I think it's about time the public would really appreciate discussions like this and our media friends as well um, in, 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 the, in the profession. I think we're joined here. Uh, by by some print uh, journalists and also from the broadcast, and we thank everyone for for joining this roundtable this morning. And uh, please welcome and thanks very much to Hans Seidel Foundation for the support for our monthly roundtable that gives you every uh, every single burning issue of this country. Please welcome the resident representative of Hans Seidel Foundation, Attorney Gats Heineke. Hi, Gats. Good morning. How are you? Hello. Hi, good Hi. morning, Ariel. I am more or less good. It's quite early, isn't it? <laughs> thank you. Um, yes, uh, thank you very much, Ariel. Thank you very much, uh, Melo. Dear ladies and gentlemen, also on behalf of the German Hans Adel Foundation, welcome very much to this roundtable discussion today about the vaccines. My name is Götz Heinecke. I'm the resident representative of the German Hans Adel Foundation. We are a German NGO here in the Philippines. We are here for more than 40 years, and it's our goal to build up democracy and good governance. Um, having said that, we uh, good governance, democracy, these are all very nice words, but um, they can only a democracy can only function when the people are informed what's going on, and that's the reason why we are working together with the Philippine Press Institute. Um, because our goal in this partnership is to inform the people about, Ariane just mentioned it, burning issues. Uh, and that's already the background why we are organizing monthly roundtable discussions. And today it's about vaccines, because it seems to me, at least here in Makati, everybody is talking about vaccines at the moment. And is it AstraZeneca and Pfizer and um, Moderna, of course, Sinovac, um, Sputnik V. The, I mean, these are all words I haven't known uh, one year ago, and and uh, yeah, <laughs> now they're in our uh, everyday conversations. Um, uh, me for myself, I know what's going on in Germany, and it, it seems to me it's maybe it's a look, looking a little bit better than here in the Philippines, but not much. And as well in Germany, we are having the same situ uh, discussions as we are having in uh, in the Philippines and also with my friends in Germany, I talk about Moderna and Sinovac and uh, Sputnik V and, and, and Pfizer BioNTech and so on. Um, so I think the whole world is talking about vaccines. Um, that's a little bit the, the background why we are we are looking forward for this roundtable discussion this morning and why we are supporting and financing it. Um, so I can just wish everyone uh, this morning have a good conversation, have a good discussion, and enjoy this morning. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Attorney Henneke. And uh, well, it's a nice uh, to have you with us. 
Uh, it's always a pleasure to listen to your thoughts coming from the outside looking in. But today, let me uh, introduce our guests because the government said yesterday uh, there were 945,745 COVID cases in the country. And from these figures, uh, about 141,375 are considered active cases and 788,322 have recovered. And from this number, uh, well, my son JP belongs to it because he recovered from COVID-19 and it was indeed a nightmare for us in the family. But we also lost friends because of COVID-19. And according to the latest report from the Department of Health, um, 16,048 were the fatalities, okay? So it has been said that a country, when a country controls the onslaught of COVID-19, the economy would soon recover. Now, different agencies said vaccines would spell the difference. Now, do we have the money for the vaccines? Uh, why is it that uh, there is this non-disclosure provision in agreements no, with the vaccine manufacturers? We'd like to find out from our guests today. So we're joined by Mr. Kelly Bird. Uh, he's the director for the Philippines of the Asian Development Bank. It's a pleasure to have uh, Kelly with us this morning. And we also have with us under Secretary Mark Dennis Hoven of the Department of Finance. Uh, he will take over Assistant Secretary uh, Paula Alvarez. So uh, under Secretary Mark Dennis Hoven will tell us more about things, about money matters. And we're also joined by uh, Dr. Nina G. Gloriani. And uh, she's the chairperson of the Vaccine Experts Panel of the Interagency Task Force on Emerging Infectious Diseases. And uh, her guardian angel is Dr. Ted Elbosa of the IATF. He's also aboard. So let's start. Can we hear from Mr. Kelly Bird uh, about how the Asian Development Bank uh, looks at the conditions in the Philippines as well as the region economically, considering the COVID-19 onslaught? Kelly, good morning and welcome. Uh, good morning, uh, Mello, and um, thank you very much for inviting me uh, to participate uh, in the um, media forum. But let me just, uh, you know, very, very briefly talk about, you know, kind of ADB's perspective on the economy. Um, later this month, uh, ADB will announce, will uh, publish its uh, Asian development outlook and we'll have, um, there we will present our forecasts. So I won't present them today. Except to say that, you know, if you look at the media uh, and, and the, the different commentaries, uh, estimates for 2021 in terms of GDP, GDP growth got a range from 4% to 6.5%. So it's a very wide range of forecasts. Uh, these are from uh, 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 international agencies, local uh, banks, and even uh, multi-development banks. Um, what that reflects is that there's just huge uncertainty in the economy, uh, and particularly about how the pandemic unfolds. And, and I always say to my colleagues, it's it's much easier to forecast the weather in the Philippines than the economy. And, that, and in fact, that's true globally. Um, so, but we do um, so, you know, we do expect though that the economy for the first half of this year will remain fragile um, <clears throat> in terms of the, the recovery. Um, and this is because of uncertainty about the pandemic, how it unfolds globally and domestically. We've seen this very unexpected surge in COVID cases in the last uh, couple of months. Um, and, and really that was unexpected. The Philippines did have, had flattened that curve, uh, was controlling uh, the spread of the, the virus in the community. And we got, we experienced this, um, this uh, very unexpected surge that's led to you know, enhanced community quarantine. So that's clearly going to drop to delay full opening of the economy. It's also going to delay the recovery. So, so it will remain uh, fragile. What we do think, though, is the main drivers of the growth will be uh, public spending, particularly on infrastructure. And this is where, in a way, the Philippines is much better placed than a lot of other countries because they've had this, they've got in place the build, build, build infrastructure program. And in times like this, getting out infrastructure investments are critically important for recovery because it's a major employer, but it also has a lot of linkages with the rest of the economy. And we know that um, 
uh, a lot of large complex projects will come out on stream this year. And so that's, that's a, you know, a positive side and, and that'll, that'll help to support uh, recovery this year and uh, next year. You know, we expect a modest increase in household spend in this year because unemployment still remains fairly high and a lot of the, and the economy is still not fully opened. Um, but we do expect uh, exports to be uh, to improve, and that would also help our recovery. But private investment will remain stagnant for most of this year, and that's because there's a lot of excess capacity. You know, and key key to a recovery, uh, key to opening up an economy is uh, the rollout of the vaccination program. Um, as we know, the government started it uh, on the first of March, um, uh, and. Uh, some significant numbers have been vaccinated. Um, and I think we all got our own anecdotal sort of stories about uh, the vaccination program. But certainly from my friends and colleagues who have been vaccinated, have found the process uh, very smooth. Um, so the system is up, up and running. Uh, it's working very well. And when more vaccines come into the country, I think it bodes very well for uh, for the Philippines, but clearly rolling out and making significant progress on vaccination will help uh, a, a faster opening of the economy in a safe way and uh, economic recovery. I will leave my remarks there. Thank you very much. Nalo. Yeah. Thank you, uh, Mr. Kelly Bird. Let's hear from Under Secretary Mark Dennis Hoven from the Department of Finance. Do we have the money for our projects? Good morning and welcome. Yeah, uh, good, good morning, Mr. Acuna. So uh, I'd like to report that basically for the 2021 budget, uh, government has set aside a total of uh, 82.5 billion for the vaccination program. So of this amount, 12.5 billion uh, comes from uh, uh, internally generated sources, while 70 billion will come from unprogrammed funds, which means that we need to borrow money for it, for this purpose. So. Uh, as of now, we've already managed to secure uh, funding in the amount of 1.2 billion or around 58 to 60 billion pesos. 1.2 billion dollars or 58 to 60 billion pesos. So uh, I guess with the with our target of 140 million doses, which is basically the vaccination of 100 percent of all adults in the Philippines, we've already secured the appropriate funding for this. So uh, now it's really a matter of. Uh, uh, scheduling delivery and managing supplies, so that uh, we don't, you know, we have a continuous feed stock, so uh, feed stock of vaccine from now until the end of the vaccination program for the year, which is the end of this year, December 31, 2021. So, mm -hmm. anything else you wish to know about the, you know, uh, about uh, uh, this matter? Yes, of course. Uh, that will just be for the opening statements and the second. Uh, okay? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. Yeah, all right. Can, can we hear from Dr. Gloriani? Dr. Gloriani, from your end, how safe and how great are the vaccines that we have in the Philippines today? Yes, uh, good morning, Sir Melo and everyone. Well, the Vaccine Expert Panel with the FDA and other um, bodies actually evaluated all these vaccines that we are now procuring. So they have all been found to be safe with only mild to moderate symptoms. Of course, there were reports of serious adverse events but they have been investigated and explained and we're now dealing with some of the communications about those uh, serious adverse events. In terms of uh, immunogenicity, all of them produce very good immune responses or what we call antibodies. And of course, the efficacy would vary between these uh, different vaccines, but in general, they have met the threshold that WHO has set. That is around 50% vaccine efficacy. Yeah. Uh, why is it that we are satisfied with the 50% threshold, Dr. Gloriani, please? We are in a pandemic, Sir Melo, and everyone. No? So uh, we, we need to deploy as much or as many vaccines as possible. But this also meet criteria, certain standards. So, But even with the 50%, we need also to, to tell everyone that this is in context. We have to consider the statistics that these vaccine companies um, give us because all of these vaccines were um, conducted, the clinical trials at least, were conducted under different conditions and under different times. So we cannot actually compare a higher vaccine efficacy with a lower one because for all you know, the, the higher one was um, 
actually conducted the clinical trials or the data were taken from when the clinical trials were uh, conducted during low low transmission uh, times and when the variants were not yet circulating. So we have to put that in context. But how do we deal with the new variants today? Uh, okay, so we, we still deal with the variants with the minimum public health standards. We want to stop transmission. And of course, we, the, these vaccines will play a very big role in actually controlling the transmission. There's still cross-reactivity. So some vaccines may have lower efficacy against the variants, but to, uh, to all together, they still cross-react. So they can still provide the protection that we need. Yeah, uh, you are representing Secretary Carlito Galvez Jr. in our forum today. But while we can have the money provided by the Department of Finance and the uh, Asian Development Bank, World Bank, and AIIB, can we source the vaccines? Because there is a global shortage of vaccines. Uh, yes, uh, the uh, government is trying very hard to negotiate with all of these vaccine developers. Well, unfortunately, of course, we hear about vaccine nationalism and those that uh, were negotiated earlier did not fall through because of, well, the, the supplies did not come for one reason or another. Some related to indemnification, some related to, you know, uh, the, um, the actual, the, some of these countries actually have a lot of cases and they have to, to give their uh, vaccines to their uh, people first and so many reasons. But what I can say is that the government is trying its best to negotiate, even through diplomatic means. Okay. Uh, Mr. Kelly Bird from the Asian Development Bank, uh, it has been said that China and Vietnam have recovered. Uh, what did they do right? And what do we need to do in the Philippines for us to be in step with Vietnam and China? Okay. Uh, Mala, thanks very much. I, th I think, first of all, you've got to look at context. Um, you know, you've got a small number of countries that achieved positive growth last year, but globally, the economy uh, contracted. Most countries, almost every country, uh, contracted. That's the norm, um, and 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 it really ranged. You know, some countries might have contracted, you know, by two percent. Some much higher than than ten percent. But if we look at the Philippines, which contracted nine point six percent. That's not actually that's not out of line of, of the range of uh, countries globally. You know, just to give you an example, the UK contracted by 9.8%, Spain over over 10%. Um, some other countries like New Zealand contracted by just over 2%. So I think what what's what made what made the difference? Um, you know, it's it's really hard to, to explain at the moment. It, it depends on the structure of the economy. Uh, it also depends on how how did the country manage the containment of the the spread of the virus. So, so that small group of countries they were able to, in a way, eliminate or um, uh, drastically reduce the transmission were able to restore confidence in business and consumers very quickly. And so they were able to, to recover uh, quickly, either through quite a significant fiscal expansion or return in uh, household spending. And it's usually a combination of both. And I think if you look at uh, the People's Republic of China and Vietnam, they were able to quickly contain almost, you know, I, I guess you could call it an elimination strategy. They were able to uh, keep those numbers very low and that allowed businesses uh, and uh, consumers to spend. They were also supplemented by rapid uh, uh, fiscal expansion. My own country, New Zealand, eliminated the, the, the virus. And elimination means that they were able to, you know, whenever there was outbreaks, they were able to contain it quickly, prevent it from spreading, uh, and let it uh, die out quickly. So in the case of New Zealand, they ran huge budget deficits, they of course closed the border, um, uh, but they were able to eliminate it and allow people to spend uh, quickly. So they did have quite robust spending in the economy and they were able to uh, minimize the contraction in the economy, but they're still contracted by about 2%. Mm -hmm. So it's really about, can you contain, can you have a good fiscal expansion? 
Uh, are you able to restore consumer and business confidence quickly? Only a handful of countries were able to do that. And there might have been special features. Countries like New Zealand, which are island countries, were able to close borders and quickly uh, respond. Uh, China and Vietnam were able to uh, close their borders quickly and able to um, eliminate those uh, 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 out, um, breakouts quickly. So, but I think that's that's the uh, kind of the, I guess the distinguishing features for them, been able to eliminate, been able to have a rapid expansion of fiscal policy. I have to say only a small, a handful of countries were able to do that to achieve a positive growth. And I can name them, it's Republic of Ireland, Tai uh, Taiwan, People's Republic of China. Uh, uh, although the, um, I think they made very, very modest uh, uh, expansion. Then there was Vietnam. So there was only about, uh, you know, just a handful of countries that were able to achieve positive growth. Yeah. Everyone else contracted. Yeah. But uh, Kelly, they say that with COVID-19 pandemic, this unmasked the kind of budget or priorities governments have on health services. Would you say that uh, what we lack in the Philippines is spending on health facilities and services and personnel? Okay, I think, um, you know, the, the Philippines, like a lot of other countries, were caught unprepared for such a pandemic, right? Most countries were actually caught unprepared. That's why they went into lockdown, uh, because they needed to suppress those, uh, the outbreak, uh, to make sure that the health, health systems were sustainable and, and, and could manage it. So I think um, it's true for most countries. Um, I, I think, uh, you, you know, uh, what the lesson is um, going forward is that, yes, you do have to have a, a good uh, budget for health care. You can do it in a number of ways and for a number of purposes, but clearly, you know, countries have to prepare for the next uh, pandemic. And that means making sure you do have the resources uh, in place and the systems in place. Um, but if you look at what Philippines done in the last 12 months, you know, back in February of last year, they had one laboratory that was capable of, of testing samples. Uh, now they have well over 100 um, and they were able to move from 6,000 tests in April, May now to somewhere around 70,000 a day. So, so they really have scaled up uh, aspects of it very, very quickly. So that's, that's been a, a successful story. But, but going forward, a lot of countries now are looking at ways to expand healthcare through public and private uh, financing, uh, but also having systems in place to prepare for the next pandemic. And, and, uh, I think, you know, that, that will happen, uh, this will happen again. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you for the insights, uh, Kelly. Uh, I'll, I'll be back in a short while, but let me ask um, Under Secretary Hogan, how has the pandemic affected government revenues? Because when there's no business, we won't have uh, taxes. So how can the government survive? Can we survive on loans? Yes. Please. Yeah. Actually, uh, that's that's the that's the problem. As we know, uh, to address the pandemic, we need to impose uh, you know quarantines, for example, which has an adverse effect on business. So. But uh, if you if you contextualize things, for example, uh, last year uh, we see we saw a uh, modest drop in tax revenues at the end of the year. So which means that at the start of the year, when the when we encountered an ECQ, there was really a big big shrinkage in terms of revenue collection. But at the tail end of the year, we saw that uh, uh, you know the uh, revenue performance somewhat improved. So this year we also expect to see the same because if you if you plot the COVID pandemic worldwide, uh, of course uh, countries will encounter waves of infection, for example. But each wave of infection does not really last beyond like two months or some two two to three months, probably two months. So so which means that uh, a strict uh, quarantine cannot continue over long periods of time. That's number one. Number two. Uh, the expectation the exp uh, we expect that uh, you know vaccine supply will drastically increase by the second half of the year you know even even with the current difficulty of securing vaccines during the first half of the year we've managed uh, so far to bring in vaccines and in our region we're uh, number three in terms of uh, inoculations so moving forward now that we've started we we see that uh, uh, vaccination will 
will uh, ramp up over the second uh, second half of the year that that in turn would uh, would of course lead to lead to uh, better or more robust growth uh, lastly you have to consider the issue of uh, uh, short term need versus long term need so during a du- during during a lockdown for example when you don't have uh, you you your revenues uh, shrink you're, you're left to you know the baseline revenues you need to address it through short term debt that's a that's a fact of life you cannot deny this but uh, how do we manage so basically we have a prioritization of debt we don't go to the commercial market as a first resort we only go to the commercial market as a last resort so between uh, you know going to the uh, ODA lenders, we first go to multilateral lenders because their tenors are the longest of all uh, lenders. Then we go to uh, bilateral lenders, which also have concessional terms and long tenors. Then we go to the commercial markets. Now mm-hmm. between foreign and domestic, we first pursue a domestic borrowing program because uh, as as we know, it has less uh, it has less uh, effects on the economy if we borrow, borrow domestically. We just manage uh, uh, expenditure as a revenue. So, so by by doing this, by taking this approach of prioritization and uh, finance mix, uh, leaning towards domestic uh, domestic borrowings, we manage the short term problems and hope to address the long term problems. But through vaccination and through gradually opening up the economy. Thank you. Yeah, do you think uh, it is high time for us to reopen the economy at this point in time when we have uh, a surge in cases? No, I, as I told you, basically, uh, a, the, the surge in cases cannot continue forever. Uh, you know, we have to think about reopening the economy. Uh, sorry, before I, before I give you my answer. Okay. While, while, we know that, uh, while we know that, of course, cases are surging right now. I, I think now is the right time to think about when we should open uh, the, reopen the economy. Because as I said earlier, uh, COVID waves uh, happen over, you know, over, over uh, a, usually a two-month period. So which means that uh, from, the, from the start of this wave, which was, uh, you know, uh, a week or two before Holy, by the way, I also got COVID during that time. Really? So, uh, there was a sudden surge, you know, two weeks before Holy Week. Eh? Yeah. So we could count forward, you know, uh, two weeks, uh, two months from that time to see, to expect the this wave to end uh, at that point. So we should, right now, we should already think about what we should do two or uh, a month or two months from now. Because we cannot, you know, we cannot always be, you know, we cannot always be uh, playing catch up with uh, with what what's happening. We should always plan ahead, think ahead and see how we can adjust depending on the current situation. Thank you. All right. Uh, Dr. Nina Gloriani, uh, I'd like to believe all vaccines available in the Philippines pass through a rigorous examination by the experts panel, which should share. How do you feel about reports that there are vaccines who got in, which got into the country illegally? <laughs> well, uh... We have uh, the FDA to take care of that. Actually, there, when there were reports of what we call the smuggled vaccines, they actually looked into that, but they were not able to, you know, catch anybody. But still, we we ask, we, we maybe implore our citizens not to use them, not you know, or to report any such activity. So I don't know all of this legitimate vaccines went through so much uh you know evaluation regulation and it is not good that we are getting this so there's a lot of problems either i don't know domestically in terms of it's not just with vaccines i guess some of these other drugs or medications are also here they um claim many uh uh, what's this uh, indications or results for COVID? But I don't know how to deal with that. So <laughs> the government should deal with that. The regulatory agencies, but even the regulatory agencies are having problems. Maybe that's what I should say. <laughs> okay, uh, because I, I I heard if I heard it right, uh, Secretary Minardo Guevara said 
uh, it did us, it did not pass through the ports, so it did pass the customs. Then, then what do we do about them? Yeah, it may have fallen from the sky. You know. <laughs> <laughs> what we try to say to people, if you use them, you bear all the, you know, whatever implications they may have if they're not good. Actually, what we have heard is some of them who use these vaccines eventually developed COVID. Mm -hmm. Okay, so there's a saying, buyers beware. Okay, there's a caveat emptor, if I recall it right. But anyway, uh, Kelly, what magic formula should we look into? Because we understand Asian Development Bank has a program uh, to assist its member countries to buy vaccines and upgrade its facilities and respond to the needs. Uh, how do you approve or how do you look into the programs being proposed to your office? So, um, uh, Nello, um, so, <coughs> sorry. Um, we have, yes, we, we launched a facility last year called APVAX. Um, and that uh, allowed, uh, that provided uh, about $9 billion of financing for our developing member countries. And, and in, in that, there are a number of uh, conditions. One is, um, uh, you know, the main one is that uh, um, eligibility criteria that the yeah. vaccine must meet a, a certain criteria to be financed under that facility. Um, but in that case, um, the Philippines was the first country to tap into this facility and we had the $400 million loan approved um, in March, on March the 10th. Um, and, and that now provides the government with uh, financing um, for vaccines. But I, I think that the, the, the core um, condition is that that vaccine should meet the eligibility criteria, uh, which is, you know, that it's really been for example, uh, emergency use listing, or it's, it's been procured through COVAX, um, or it's got a emergency uh, use um, authorization from a stringent regulatory authority. So as long as it meets those conditions, um, they they are eligible for financing under, under the loan. Um, Philippines was the first to tap it. We had one approved for Indonesia, um, and there's several other countries that will that will tap into this facility over the next uh, couple months. Okay, let's be clear about this because uh, in one uh, talk to the people address of uh, uh, President Rodrigo Duterte, he said the money from the facilities like Asian Development Bank is not with us. It is with the financing institution and that you are to pay the vaccine manufacturers if and when they pass your stringent measures. Tell us, uh, is it really the case, uh, Kelly? Well, under ADB procurement rules, we have a number of options in terms of uh, financing and, and how do we pay. So we, we do have, um, you know, under under all ADB loans, uh, it would follow ADB procurement rules uh, for projects. Um, you know, we have options where uh, ADB can make direct payments to the vaccine suppliers on behalf of the government. Uh, and, that, and that was chosen by the government. Uh, um, so that, uh, you know, they, they are the kind of the different options that we have. So the main purpose of the facility was to ensure a quick response. Uh, and, and even ADB's procurement rules and guidelines were streamlined for this purpose. <clears throat> and one of those, one of those ways of making sure it's a quick response is ADB pays the vaccine producer directly rather than, say, going through uh, government accounts because that, that also adds on uh, time. And, and that was the main purpose for that. And, and it's really uh, for governments to, to choose. And in this case, uh, we agreed for ADB to make those direct payments. Mm -hmm. And how do you qualify vaccine manufacturers? Oh, I, I think, as I mentioned before, as long as the vaccine passes the eligibility criteria. Okay. Eligibility criteria of the WHO, right? Um, we have under the APVAX, there's three criteria. One of them is uh, that it's been selected for procurement under COVAX, and that requires a WHO emergency use listing, or the vaccine's got a um, emergency use authority uh, authority 
from what we call a stringent regulatory um, authority. So the US, UK, uh, Australia, or the EU, for example. As long as they get those uh, emergency use, then of course they must get the Philippines uh, FDA uh, emergency use, um, and then they're eligible. Okay, thank you. Uh, Dr. Nina Gloriani, tell us more about this. Uh, so which vaccines would qualify for uh, ADB, AIIB, and World Bank? Well, uh, we now have six EUA-approved uh, vaccines, and I think four of them are EU, well, uh, WHO listed, you know, emergency use listing. But they all also have GMP certificates, which we looked at. So basically these are, well, the first one was Pfizer, although Pfizer has not come in at all. We have AstraZeneca, which is under COVAX also. And then, well, Sinovac, I believe is not under COVAX, but we have EUL from, from other, UA from other countries. And then uh, Gamaleya, Sputnik V. And then we have just recently, just two days ago, uh, Janssen or jo Johnson & Johnson and Bharat Biotech were approved by the FDA. So those last two, uh, I believe Janssen would have would qualify for the EUA stringent uh, regulatory agency, but Bharat, uh, we just have uh, EUA. Okay. From the Department of Finance, um, we had these loans from multilaterals, no? uh, like uh, ADB, AIIB, and World Bank. How will it impact on our debt uh, to GDP ratio? Okay, so if you if you look at this, Melo, let's let's put things in the proper perspective. Okay, uh, do you know that one month of uh, ayuda costs around eighty billion pesos? Hmm, really? Yes. So <laughs> basically, uh, the entire vaccination program of the entire country which will cover you know a period of at, uh, around a year for example is equivalent to one month of uh, having a stringent you know uh, one month of an ECQ uh, one month ECQ and uh, and when when the government needs to provide social amelioration so that's the so between again an immediate need a or a or uh, between between you know spending for spend spending for vaccination and borrowing money or uh, borrowing money and spending for social amelioration. I, I guess you know the uh, uh, we it's clear which is uh, which is the more effective option. It's number one. Number two, in terms of financing, the good thing here is that all three multilaterals provide very concessional loans, uh, which have very low interest rates. This is number one and number two, very long tenors. So uh, when we say very low interest rates, uh, I think they charge right now LIBOR plus a. Uh, LIBOR plus uh, 60 basis points to 80 basis points. So, or sorry, LIBOR plus 40 basis points to, to 60 basis points. So that's the equivalent of an annual interest rate of 0.6% uh, to 0.6% uh, to 0.8% per annum. So mm -hmm. it's really low, right? Now, looking at repayment, for example, first, first repayment, first debt servicing will happen in 2024. And the last uh, debt servicing will happen in 2039. So you're really dealing with a very long period of time uh, within which to pay for the loan. So it doesn't really adversely impact, uh, you know, uh, the the uh, the repayment prospects of these loans. So again, on the on the short term issue, it's really it's really uh, more effective to spend for vaccines rather than spending for you know social mediation. Number two. Uh, in so far as the capacity to pay, there's there's clearly a capacity to pay because we're dealing with a very long tenor, uh, long tenor uh, debt. Mm -hmm. So what you're saying is we have the economy to uh, settle all these loans, no? because yes. they are soft loans, right? Yes. Okay. So at least there's light at the end of the tunnel, and the tunnel doesn't get longer every day, no? Yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> that's that's the objective basically. The, the objective is to, you know, to address this problem as soon as possible so that we can go back to where we were before before the pandemic. Yeah. So that's what China did, right? Ah, okay. But there are laws that uh, were passed recently that would give incentives to big business rather than taxing them. 
uh, uh, that's not true. That uh, basically, you cannot simply equate. Uh, you cannot simply equate uh, corporations with big businesses. Even there, you know, there are different sizes of corporations. There are small, small and medium corporations. There are big corporations. So there, all of them are entitled to the same lower corporate tax rate. It's number one. Number two, uh, we must not fail to consider the train amendments, which was uh, pre-COVID. So the government already provided. Uh, a lower tax rate for the for the you know for for wage earners early on so we're just equalizing the tax burden now Thank you. i see okay uh kelly uh, there are countries dependent on tourism dependent on agriculture uh what do you think would covid 19 pandemic teach us okay um Okay, I can answer that in two ways. You know, for um, you know, there there are there are lessons. Okay, so clearly the structure, the, the impact on the economies will depend on the structure of the, the structure of the economy. So those economies that have large tourism sectors, uh, like like the Philippines, um, you know, it it means that they will get uh, that the shock will be larger um, than say. A, economy that has uh, a very high share of uh, household uh, spending. Um, we also know with the tourism sector, because a lot of countries have closed borders uh, and uh, consumers may be a little reluctant to uh, travel for some time, you know, we do expect that uh, the international tourism sector not to recover until 2024. Of course, you know, having a, a globe, having a vaccine program that Vaccinates most of the global population would would help to to make that happen sooner. But you know, you know that's going to be a a, a big task. So most uh, assessments are 2024. Um, so we don't we don't expect. So that's clearly is going to affect the tourism sector uh, in the in the Philippines. Um, the the second point is that we might uh, see structural change occurring in the economy. You know, a shock like this to the Philippines and to the global economy is going to trigger some kind of structural change. And you're going to find businesses that are going to rely and invest more on digitalization of their businesses. They will be looking at uh, new arrangements for working in the office. Um, and that might mean some sectors will not uh, be employing as or, or the the demand for workers might be might not be as large as it was in the past, but there might be other sectors where uh, employment growth might be might be rapid. So, so some sectors will become large uh, employment generators; others will be uh, less so. So, so there are going to be impacts on the labour market. Um, we are we are concerned not just for the Philippines but for other middle income countries is that there may be some long lasting negative impacts on the labor market where we might see unemployment elevated for a little bit elevated uh, for some time longer or wage and salary employment might slow down. Um, but there are ways that governments globally are thinking about how to assist, you know, how to mitigate these long lasting, potentially long lasting effects. For example, we find a lot of uh, governments are now scaling up funding and reforming the apprenticeship programs so that they can train more young people with marketable skills. Um, they are looking at innovative ways of funding enterprise-based training. Um, countries are also looking at, uh, looking at fiscally sustainable ways to provide income stability for workers during times of uh, shocks. So for example, a lot of countries are looking at social unemployment insurance um, that uh, a well-funded program, so that uh, in the future when we have uh, shocks, uh, there will be funding. You know, you can rely. You'd have a system that's in place, a funding system that could provide income stability to uh, workers. So you know, wage subsidies are very important, but you know, you can't have wage subsidies for long periods. So a social unemployment program would be important for that. Um, so I think that, that some of the, the lessons learned uh, from this pandemic. Okay, because uh, while we can be uh, inoculated with effective vaccines and tourism facilities would be open, we may not have the money to travel. No? 
that is another issue, right? Well, well, yes, and, and we might expect, uh, um, yes. So, so as 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 economies are recovering and, and households are rebuilding their savings, for example, or reducing their debts, um, they may they may delay spending on on uh, travel, um, etc. Um, but I think that the important point is vaccination pro program will help to ensure a safe opening and a quicker recovery. Um, but we do expect some structural change to occur where some sectors will grow fast, others may struggle uh, over the medium term. And that's where, you know, it's going to affect people's uh, opportunities in the labour market. And that's where governments uh, need to bring in some, some new reforms in skills training, labour market programs, so that can help uh, young people acquire those skills, those new skills that will be demanded. And that's why I mentioned beforehand, apprenticeship programs, scaling up those programs uh, are going to be important to ensure that young people do acquire those uh, labour market, you know, marketable skills, particularly skills that will be in demand uh, in, in, in the future. Yeah, but Kelly, but you will also agree with me that an important part of our GDP and gross national income uh, comes from foreign remittances. Now, the Department of Labor said over half a million Filipinos were repatriated because they lost their jobs. How will this impact on our GDP and GNI? Okay, there's two things to consider. You know, what uh, remittances uh, shrunk by about just less than 1% last year. Mm -hmm. And I think most people were expecting a much larger shrinkage, right? There were estimates that they would shrink by 20%. They didn't. Um, and I think that tells us that there is certainly is a, still a large number of uh, OFWs overseas working, but but remittances are what we what we call counter cyclical. That is when the economy is going through some difficult times, Filipino workers will send back more funding to their to their uh, families. Uh, in good times, they spend they'll send back less. Uh, they'll save it instead. So so that's what's happened. What we expect in 2021 is remittances to actually moderately grow. Um, that's because uh, the global economy is reopening. Uh, so those uh, sectors are starting to reopen, which which employ uh, Filipinos. We might also expect, uh, you know, perhaps towards the later part of this year, uh, a reversal in uh, flows of uh, Filipino workers. Um, we also know that Filipino workers, uh, you know, they overseas Filipino workers, are, um, it's a very diverse set of uh, workers, you know, diversity in terms of locations and occupations. And that, that's a big advantage because it allows, you know, it, that, that's one reason why those remittances remained uh, fairly buoyant uh, in 2020 and also in 2021. Okay. All right. Uh, I'd like to open the floor to our colleagues from the media who may have questions. Uh, let's try with uh, Ms. Uh, Maureen Simeon of Philippine Star. Maureen, uh, please unmute and go ahead with your question. Hello, sir. Good morning. Yes, go ahead. Uh, this question, sir, is for Dr. Nina. Uh, doc, uh, the government is targeting to inoculate 70 million Filipinos by end of 2021. Uh, do we think that this target is uh, still visible for the year? And follow-up question for Mr. Kelbert and Undersecretary Huben. Um, how about the possibility of uh, failing or achieving to meet the government's vaccination target affect um growth prospects in, of the economy for this year, especially on boosting consumer confidence since vaccines will definitely um, affect uh, consumer confidence. Thank you, sir. All right. Thank you, Maureen. Uh, Dr. Gloriani, please. Yes. Uh, I'd like to be very positive and optimistic. Well, given the limitations with the supplies, but we are now looking at um, more EUA-approved vaccines. So as I said earlier, we have six. So may maybe I should update you on what's happening. Sinovac will be coming in this April with around 1 million doses. And from Yusek Kabotahe, that's already sure to come this April. Gamalea, 20,000 doses. We already 
discuss this. There will be a modeling to use the 20,000 first so that other LGUs can uh, use that mo model of actually deploying the vaccine. And uh, although the 400, the rest of the 480,000 doses still tentative, but I think it will come sooner than uh, later. You know, they were saying the Malaya Sputnik V will come in around April, but if, even if it comes in May, it should still be all right. It's the Pfizer vaccines that we are having problems with. This is the under the COVAX facility, so I, I really do not know what's uh, keeping them from uh, supplying us with just 100,000 doses. But from May to June, we expect 10.5 million doses from different vaccines. Uh, Sinovac, Gamaleya, or the Sputnik V, Moderna, if Moderna applies for EUA, it has not done so, sorry, no? Uh, from COVAX, we have AstraZeneca and also Pfizer, and that's for May and June. For July, well, it will be more or less the same, but as I said, we need the EUA for Moderna, we hope Janssen can come in with their one dose, the single doses that they are uh, claiming to be uh, good enough under this pandemic. And uh, well, of course, AstraZeneca, we, we need to get more from the COVAX facility. I think uh, what COVAX facility or WHO has said is they, the AstraZeneca vaccines will come at this April or May. Yeah, thank you. Reactions to the next question of our good friend, Maureen uh, Kelly. Um, thanks, thanks, uh, Mela. I'm sorry, Maureen, could you repeat your question? Uh, yeah, sure, sir. Uh, just regarding sir, the vaccination also, um, how do you think, uh, what is the, how will the possibility of either failing or achieving to meet the government's vaccination target affect um, economic growth prospects for the rest of the year, especially in terms of boosting consumer con confidence, which is very much important uh, to um, allow the economy to recover. Thank you, sir. Okay, thank, okay, thank you, uh, Maureen. So, so clearly um, the vaccine, the rollout of the vaccine program is going to be critically important for, you know, a safe opening of the economy and building consumer and business confidence. Um, you know, as the program is, uh, I think as, as Music Mark uh, mentioned, you know, the, the bulk of the supplies are coming in the second half of this year. So with solid progress um, in, in vaccinating the population, that, that will help significantly to restore um, confidence. And we see that with some other countries that have, uh, um, that have uh, vaccinated their significant share of their populations, like for example, Israel, where they have now vaccinated over 50% of their population. You know, they're now opening their economy uh, significantly. Those numbers of uh, cases have dropped um, and uh, it's really has boosted uh, particularly consumer confidence. Um, so I think uh, we would, uh, it's going to be um, important. And I think that's when we'll see uh, more consumer spending occurring in the second half of the year as progress has been made with the rollout of the vaccination program. Thank you. Yes, uh, Mr. Undersecretary, your thoughts, please. Yeah, so so I agree with Kelly, of course, that uh, you know uh, it's critical to have a a successful roll rollout of the vaccination program to build more uh, build more consumer confidence and there, thereby uh, have the economy move forward. But this notwithstanding, I, I guess we have to consider, you know, our performance in 2020 to ref to to, uh, to to reference to our performance for 2021. So, if we look at a you know a single wave, uh, sing single wave, uh, single infection wave uh, in 2021, then uh, we see we believe that the you know the economic trajectory would would be more or less like the one we had in. In 2020, where we saw a, a modest improvement in economic activity after the after the first wave we, we've encountered uh, last uh, March 2020 until around uh, June, I think June 2020, we saw that you know economies uh, the economy started to pick up in August, if I remember correctly, until the end of the year and until early this year. So that's the baseline performance, but. We of course want uh, more than a baseline performance. We want the 
economy to emerge from this pandemic. And we want it to happen as soon as possible. So we want to fast track the vaccination program to make this happen. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Uh, I'd like to ask this question to Dr. Nina. You know, uh, Dr. Gloriani, I had my uh, job last Sunday. It's a Sinovac in Quezon City. And I'm supposed to have my second dose on May 20 this year. Am I assured of my second dose? Well, I think so. Yes, sir. Sinovac will be supplying. Actually, Sinovac has been the one vaccine company who has been very good at, you know, keeping their promises. And they say they're, they're supplying. Uh, as I said, Dr. Yusek Kabotahe already said that 1 million doses are sure to come. It's not tentative like the others. Yeah. So, pwede na sabihin, pwede lang itaga sa bato, ano? Yes, po. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, you know, I, I heard Ambassador uh, Jose Manuel Romualdez say yesterday in jest that while the Americans were interested in the visiting forces agreement, he said he talked to his counterparts lightheartedly and said, why don't we have vaccine forces agreement first? Because this is what we need. I wouldn't want to put words into your mouth, but do you see something political in uh, the vaccines coming from America? Are they preventing it from, you know, getting the vaccines here because of some important deals they need to forge with us? Uh, I think I'm looking more at va vaccine nationalism, that they want to um, inoculate or immunize 100% or at least 70 to 80% of their population the, the shortest time possible. So it's more of, I think, vaccine nationalism, uh, but uh, that's why they are holding, hoarding, the, the, maybe the word is really hoarding. I, that's how I look at it. No, no, nothing, I think, political, but it's really for the entire citizens. I see. There's a question here. Would it not be better to open partially the market for vaccines and allow hospitals and doctors to buy the vaccine and give it or sell it to their patients? as this is the case with other vaccines already, like the anti-flu and uh, the like? Uh, we were constrained right now because all of these vaccines are under emergency use authorization and none of this should actually be sold commercially. So th that is the term of the EUL. So l let us wait a while and wait the government is providing these vaccines for free and a lot of the private sector is actually pitching in to immunize as many uh, what we call the economic, uh, the frontliners as possible. So let's wait a while. It will come. I can assure you it will come. The market forces will come maybe for the third dose or the booster dose. But for this primary series that we need, let's, let's, let's use uh, the, whatever we have, what's being offered to us. These are all under EUA. After about now, now not, not one year anymore, about six months, we hope at least one of them will have pure, uh, full uh, certificate of product registration, and that makes it available. So I until then. I'm that optimistic. Huh? Okay. Okay. Uh, I would like to solicit your messages to the general public, to the media, to the general public watching us uh, from the United States, from Saudi Arabia, and uh, from military camps. Uh, what do you see in the near future? Uh, doctor, especially with uh, this vaccine hesitancy among Filipinos. Well, <laughs> this vaccine, vaccine hesitancy has been addressed somehow. Well, maybe I should give my own uh, experiences. We've been communicating with all possible sectors for, you know, using town hall meetings, webinars, whatever platform we could use. And from these experiences, after, well, there's a, a, a group of us or a number of us who talk about different aspects of the COVID vaccines or even COVID itself. And after these town hall meetings, more people uh, get to accept the, the vaccine. So, so, so we're very happy with that. Just yesterday, I was with the Philippine, uh, the Professional Regulations Commission, with, with the high power, their commissioners. And they, they were very happy to listen to the explanation. So the vaccine hesitancy, I think, is being addressed. So we are looking at, you know, when all of these vaccines come, they will see that many are getting uh, immunized. 
And you know, by by sheer and by yon, <laughs> parang peer ano yan, peer pressure or the the mahuhuli po sila pag hindi sila nagpabakuna. So it's better that ano. It, I think that is what will happen. That's what I foresee. So yeah. it's just a matter of getting the vaccines here. Pero yung bang mga karamihan ng health workers na bakunahan na? Uh, I think na sa 70%, sorry po. Uh, compared to yung 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 mga February or bago po before the March one the the Sinovac came, mm-hmm. there was some hesitancy. But and then when, the, when there was a, a flip, you know, they were expecting Pfizer and then Sinovac came again. The hesitancy grew. But but after that, when we tried to you know communicate that this is also good for you, it's better than not having nothing, no? But the 50% is still 50, and as I said, it's in context. So but there was greater acceptance after that. And now they are asking, actually, the ones, uh, the, the healthcare workers are now asking for their vaccines, but they, they will be prioritized as already uh, announced. Uh-huh. Have you had yourself vaccinated already, Dr. Yes, Melo, second day of the vaccination when the vaccination started that was march 2 i had the sinovac job and then second dose after 29 days okay can we hear from dr ted elbosa he's still on the line ted you also had your job right yes melo i also also had my job also sinovac on the first day march 1 together with the uh, director gapli gaspi at the philippine general hospital and together with fda director uh, Eric Domingo and together with the uh, IATF consultant Dr. Edsel Salvana. Okay, so no side effects, no adverse effects? Well, the side effects were the usual in the afternoon. I had body malay, fever, uh, nothing paracetamol couldn't take and the following day I was okay. Oh, okay. So that's actually good from the doctor's point of view. You want that immune response to happen. In fact, when your temperature rises, that means your immune mechanism was actually triggered by the vaccine. So I knew then probably the, the Sinovac injection was not distilled water, <laughs> but it was actually but triggered my, the immune response. But in my case, I didn't have any adverse effect. So could it be possible that the vaccine I got was fake? No, it's uh, every person has a different <laughs> immune response. You know, some people's immune response are strong immediately. Some are mild. Some are not felt. But your body's immune uh, uh, cells are actually acting up and uh, doing their job. Okay. Are you optimistic we can still have the rollout? Oh, definitely. I think the schedule was uh, presented last Wednesday at the uh, television to the president. Uh, I am glad we took on a portfolio of vaccines because of this global shortage which you all have described. This was a good strategy. And we have to commend Nina Gloriani because it was the vaccine expert panel that suggested to the IATF that we take on a uh, portfolio of vaccines. As now we have about seven sources of vaccines. The mm-hmm. other big break that we got is as early as November, the private sector joined in the procurement of the vaccines. You remember that uh, the group Go Negosho and all the other big shots, Taipans joined in and uh, led in signing a ordering from Astra even before Astra had an EUA. Remember, they took a risk by that. So when they did that, their their vaccines are now arriving, I think in May. So that's contributing to the to big number of vaccines that are coming in. So actually the hard part is as, as what people are always questioning is can we make the 70 million vaccinees because it's not a simple matter. Huh? Vaccination as a deployment program is not a very simple matter. Injection is a very simple matter in the in the arm, but the deployment of all these vaccines to all the people that need them is a very complex logistics and supply chain management together with uh, a lot of human resource and a lot of vaccination centers needed. Okay. Uh, can I call on Assistant Secretary Paula Alvarez? Uh, she's with us today. Uh, what are we to expect from the Department of Finance in trying to convey the messages to the general public? Yes, uh, Assistant Secretary Paula Alvarez, please. 
Yes. Uh, good morning, everyone, and thank you for having us today. Um, I think what we need to do right now. Can you hear me video as well? Sorry, sorry, sir. Can you hear me? Video. Yes. Okay. So actually, what we need to do now is actually work on communication because you know there are a lot of misinformation in terms of vaccines in terms of how the government plans to actually pay for this so i think it really boils down to how do we help people understand for us to be to become uh more resilient especially in this critical time so you know there are a lot of fake news always going around uh, uh in relation to vaccines and i think it's it's uh, upon us to actually communicate what is the benefits of vaccines, why do we need to be vaccinated, and why it's essential for us to actually economically recover. So I think these things are something, you know, it is upon the media also to help us communicate as uh, public communicators. I think this is actually part of the Bayanihan spirit to, for us to actually help people understand. So I think this is where the DOF um, is now. Uh, we are more transparent. So all of these loans that we have talking, we are talking about are uploaded once they are actually done in terms of negotiations. So once we are not prohibited by law to to divulge information, we we upload them in our Facebook, in our website. So it's all there. So people should be more informed with the correct information. So thank you, sir. All right. Can we now call on Under Secretary Dennis Oven, please? Mr. Under Secretary? Sure. Yes, yes, please. Yes, your message, please. Well, uh, anyway, uh, all I can say is, uh, you know, uh, pasensya na po to the general public that uh, it's taking uh, some time to bring unmasked uh, vaccine supplies. But uh, rest assured that uh, moving forward, we have the we have steady supplies now. So moving forward, we expect the vaccination rollout to proceed as expected, uh, uh, so that we reach, you know, we 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 reach the target uh, target vaccine. We 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 reach the objective of vaccinating uh, the entire adult population by the end of the year or uh, by first quarter of uh, 2022. Yeah. Okay. Very well. Thank you very much, uh, Kelly from ADB. Your message. Uh, thank you, uh, Milo. I think my, my key message would be, you know, the, the economic contraction last year and, and the, the economy, it's been, you know, hard on everyone globally, uh, individuals, families and businesses. It's been, it's been very hard, very stressful and, and combined with the uncertainty. But, um, you know, the, the light is there, um, the light in the tunnel, uh, the economy is starting to recover. Um, I'm very optimistic that the economy will get back to its 6% um, uh, growth rates. Um, and in that sense, you know, the Philippines has place a, in place a number of policy levers, program levers that will help with that uh, recovery. You know, the, the first point is, you know, the government is running uh, fisc large fiscal deficits. Uh, debt is sustainable. And, and the fiscal expansion has been very targeted. It's been helping with, for example, last year, wage subsidies, uh, also transfers to um, uh, lower income families, and they're continuing with that this year. And of course, they have the Build, Build, Build program in place. That's, that's And we'll see this year and next year some very large projects come on stream that will help uh, with the economic recovery. Um, I also see that you know the, the economy has a, a well-educated labor force, and and while uh, more needs to be done in terms of training, I also think that bodes well for uh, for the labor market adjusting to the new norm in the future. But I but I am optimistic that the economy will get back on track to its uh, six percent growth growth rate uh, like it had uh, for the last uh, six or seven years. Yes, uh, thank you. Uh, it's indeed a pleasure to have you all with us. We'd like to say thank you to our resource persons who took time out to share their views and opinions and facts and figures about what's going on in the country today and what to expect. I'd like to acknowledge our viewers in the United States and in the Middle East. Thank you very much for taking time out despite the time difference. We look forward to more discussions. Again, thank you very much to uh, Kelly Bird of the ADB and uh, to ASEC, uh, Paola Alvarez, to Undersecretary 
uh, Mark Dennis Oven, to Dr. Nina Gloriani and Dr. Ted Erbosa. We also invited the World Bank to sit with us. However, the tight schedule of uh, the country representative to Brunei, Malaysia, the Philippines, and Thailand just wouldn't fit our schedule. So we look forward to more discussions. Thank you. God bless us all. And let's pray for everyone who had COVID-19 and those recovering. Thank you. It's a pleasure. Have a nice day. Thank you. Uh, the local media for some time now we struggle with survival issues and exactly so that's the problem uh sometimes you be you could become uh guilty uh, as journalists we do our work uh, regardless information also from or it's lack of access of information that makes reporting difficult yes they feel the absence yeah. of the local at uh, tinitiyak po natin na uh, kung anumang mga pag-aabuso na maaaring na kumita. We um, wish PTI for a longer success. Ang PPA po will be joining other media organizations in support in solidarity for it. So there is no escaping uh, to progress. We had some new activities, great activities. Uh, we had the, the COVID chronicles that uh, strengthen the regional memberships, the existing media and information literacy, security of the workers in their job. Brutus judicial harassment campaign against Rockler. And then, of course, it, it is saddening that basic human rights are violated. We should first thank uh, institutions like the PPI, uh, and other NGOs. I believe that journalism education must address the issues and challenges discussed this afternoon. Let's not be quick to judge. Let's not be quick to insult others. So I hope that... Uh, I believe that there's a statesman in every politician and it's up to us to find it in every way we can. Sana yung evidence-based na behavior maritain natin in terms of conversation. And so when uh, opportunities like these arise, you know, for both Nicolás and myself to be supportive, ga balangkas tayo ng polisiya, yung tinatawag nating learner support aids. We try to factor <laughs> each of these posts, lalo if we find maging mapagmatyag rin sa post mismo ng account o page. So yung bullying and sexual harassment is very common. Go back to the basics. Uh, one thing is, you know, ang nakita kong development is using mobile devices to follow up. And we're creating modules now, obviously, with the help of the Department of Education also. Now more than ever, at any other time, journalists need to uphold their core values. There's been a significant shift in coverage of Mindanao by non-Mindanaoan reporters. So there has to be a partnership between Comelec, the, the social media uh, provider. So there's just really no way to change and reform the law to make it responsive to the very intent of the law. And we should work together on a, in improving that relationship. My favorite quote of Jefferson that I'd rather have a newspaper without government and society than government without newspaper. Thanks everyone. Please join us in an, our other online activities with PPA and our partner organizations. Maraming salamat po. Keep safe.